Hello, I hope you are well. My name is Alex, and today we are asking, is it ethical to use the advances in biotechnology to extend the human lifespan? A small beginner's guide to biotech ethics. First, what we're going to do today is define biotechnology. In 1991, the FDA defined biotech by stating that it is the application of biological systems and organisms to technical and industrial processes. And then in 2018, the University of Kansas defined it by stating it is an exciting field fueled by the ability to transfer genetic information between organisms with the goal of understanding important and biological processes or creating a useful product. You can see here that biotech has gone from a relatively simple definition to more and more complex throughout the years. Some common biotechnology terms and methods that you may have heard of before are things like recumbent DNA technology, molecular cloning, gene editing, gene therapy, genotyping, and genosequencing. All forms of biotechnology are made to benefit and extend human lives and lifespans. Basic forms of biotech have existed in agriculture for millennia, with the use of crossbreeding and selective breeding. Domesticating foods and animals have been used to grow and breed in specific ways to enhance their benefiting features, such as making corn larger or cows meatier. People have been doing this to make it so surviving can be easier, and surviving easier means that people can live longer. An example of advanced modern biotechnology in agriculture is golden rice by the company Syngenta. What they have done is transfer DNA from a daffodil into rice, and this has made vitamin A rich rice. The goal of their humanitarian project is to donate to areas that are deficient in the nutrient as deficiencies in vitamin A can lead to larger health concerns. Turning to medicine, some common examples that have been standardized include things like vaccinations, antibiotics, insulin, and hormones. Using inactivated clones of viruses, scientists can produce vaccinations that can fight continually developing strains of that very same virus, similarly with antibiotics with bacteria. As early as 1980, insulin has been used to treat diabetes and then hormones are used to treat growth disorders in children. With vaccinations and antibiotics and other standardized forms of biotechnology in agriculture, it can be said that this is why the human life expectancy has nearly doubled in the last 200 years. Here is a map of the world from 1800 to 2015, starting with the one from 1800, where the global average age was 29 years old, and then in 1950, the global average age was 46 years old. Finally, in 2015, the global average was 71 years old. And so it can be said that with all of the advances in biotechnology, this is why the human lifespan has gone up nearly 40 years in the last 200 years, along with many other advancements too, of course. Examples of advanced modern biotech and medicine include gene therapy. Gene therapy is one of the types of biotech that is becoming more and more common. These include two types, germline gene therapy and somatic cell gene therapy. With germline gene therapy, this is used to treat hereditary disorders within fertilized eggs. This is the type of technology that could be potentially used to make what is known as designer babies. Somatic cell gene therapy is used on non-germline cells and is also broken down into two parts. These are to introduce new genes into either stem cells or other organs and tissues to treat disorders. Another example is stem cell use in research. This is in either embryotic and somatic stem cells. These types of stem cells are found in embryos, umbilical cords, blood, and bone marrow, and they can 
can be used to recreate cells and treat complicated disorders. Embryos, interestingly enough, can recreate any cell in the body, and this is why they're on much of a lockdown than bone marrow stem cells. Because the misuse of stem cells can lead to different types of diseases and cancers, the FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb had this to say in a newsletter. There are a small number of unscrupulous actors who are exploiting the uncertainty in order to make deceptive and sometimes corrupt assurances to patients based on unproven and, in some cases, dangerously dubious products. In addition, the FDA will continue to work closely with the industry to find other ways to aid in the effort to bring novel therapies to patients. The reason why our question today is on if we ought to use biotech to extend the human lifespan is because the ethicality of which would cause a myriad more of ethical questions, and one of which is this, whose lifespan? In the United States in 2016, the average life expectancy was 78.6 years old. But when you look at a side-by-side -side comparison of the entire globe of the life expectancy in 2015 versus the average household income in 2020, you can see that there is a visible difference in who can afford an extended lifespan. Some example countries that can be looked at closer on the websites, Australia, the United States, and India. In Australia, the average life expectancy is 83 years old, where they make an average income of $46,500. In the United States, the average life expectancy is 79, where they make $43,500. In India, the life expectancy is 68 with an average income of $3,200. In Chad, the average life expectancy is 53 years old with an average household income of $2,400. So the question that I'll ask again is who today can already afford an extended lifespan? Biotechnology in effect today, using example companies to perceive ethics. The first example is Novartis's Chimera, the first FDA-approved form of gene therapy, which was in 2017. This was developed for those with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, otherwise known as ALL, and this drug is reserved for the 15 to 20 patients whose cancer has not responded to previous treatments that have already been created. In Novartis's clinical trial, 83% of their 63 patients were in remission after a median average of 29 days. The risks included other patients who have died in cases where they had cerebral edemas, a condition in which excessive fluid causes the brain to swell. There is a substantial difference in what Chimera does cost, ought to cost, and then compared to a 2,000-year cost analysis of a previous method. The president of Patients of Affordable Drugs, David Mitchell, shared with Forbes that Novartis's 475,000 breakthrough should only cost $160,000 and would still make Novartis a profit. A cost analysis in the year 2000 wrote that the total cost of the entire treatment was only $103,250 per patient, and 53% was in basic hospital costs. I wrote on the chart here care price because they included every single step, including the hospital costs and then the rest of the drugs, tests, bloods, and everything else. In the cost analysis, the treatment they were analyzing had an average 80% chance of remission, which is only 3% less than the chance with Chimera, but is still triple the price of what the patient advocate said it ought to be. The next example is Sparks's Luxturna. In the same year, it was also the first FDA form of gene therapy for an inherited disease and was developed to help those with inherited retinal diseases, where previously the only other alternative was to offer visual aids such as canes, learning braille, and etc. There was not too many statistics on the benefits and risks of Luxturna, but it was said to be very successful with the same risks as many other surgical procedures. 
The surprise here was that many analysts expect Sparks' drug might have been priced at $1 million, but the company Spark decided to choose a lower price with $425,000 per eye because insurers indicated that pricing the drug higher would trigger restrictions on which patients could get access. So rather than three times higher, the company actually priced it at $150,000 less than expected. A quote from Kagri Baziri, MD, PhD, from University of Michigan's Kellogg Eye Center, says, Ultimately, we want these therapies to be available for our youngest patients. The sooner they receive the treatment, the less vision loss they may have to endure. So while creating new medicines takes money, time, research, testing, patenting, getting approved, processing, shipping, advertising, and money again, a company ought not to see a profit as the main goal as much as they should want to see a worldwide improvement on human health. There are points of standardization and worldwide effort, such as common medicines available to people in most countries, like vaccinations, antibiotics, insulin, and then there's also companies like Syngenta who are making golden rice to donate to nutrient deficient areas, and Spark, who is looking for cures where there are no other alternatives. This is where I see the largest ethical issue, the life expectancy gap. There is a 30-year difference between the highest average household income country and the lowest against their average life expectancy. And then there's a 40-year difference between the entire globe 200 years ago and then the average lifespan today. So in going back to the original question, is it ethical to use the advances in biotechnology to extend the human lifespan? My answer is this. Only if the means to do so are standardized to a point in which all socioeconomic classes have the technology available to them. Moreover, biotech innovations ought to be pointed toward more diseases with no other cure to the state. And thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I hope you had a great day. Bye!